there's an expression. It's all theory until it actually happens. So in our lives, there are things that we have, like these visions, these ideas. This is how it's going to play out. This is how the situation's going to go. And then you actually get into it. And experience is the best teacher, and you realize, boy, I was way off in how I thought that that was going to play out. For many, it's, it's like just all the areas of our lives, the big transition points. And so you go from like high school to college, and you have an idea of what college is going to be like, and how you're going to get away, and you're going to get freedoms, and finally, and then you realize when you start making mistakes that the reason your parents told you what they told you is because there are consequences for your actions and you get to learn the fun way or learn the hard way, whichever way that you learn. And then you start to like, okay, this is a little different than what I thought it was going to be. And then you go and get your first job. Like I can remember going from Bible college to my first ministry. So it's like you're taught for four years. This is how it's going to play out. This is how it's going to go. This is how ministry is going to look. This is how you figure out conflict. This is how you launch new ministries. And it was all theory. And then you got into it. And you're like, I'm going to burn all of my notes. Like, this is not going the way I thought it was going to go. And then you get married. And during the engagement period and, and during the uh, premarital counseling sessions, you know, everything's going to be different for you too. You're going to be different than your parents. You're not going to fight. When you fight, you're going to say, I'm sorry. And then things look a little different after the first few years of marriage. And then you have kids. That's maybe the biggest one in my life that I had these visions of grandeur. Like, no, this is how it's going to be. When, you have ki- when we have kids, they're going to sit and be quiet during dinner. They're not going to be rambunctious and rowdy. And like, you just have these different things. Our kids are going to sleep through the night. We're not going to, and if they don't, honey, I'll get up with the kids. That was my vision of grandeur. Honey, I'll get up with the baby and I'll change the diaper. And like, she wake me up at six o'clock in the morning. She's like, I got up four times. You didn't, you didn't wake up one time. What's the wrong with you? Well, it's because I, it's all theory until it's two o'clock in the morning and the baby's crying. Then it like is actually something you have to do. And then like to continue our series on managing our money God's way, there's your financial picture. And you have an idea of how things are going to go and how you're going to spend your money and how much money you're going to make. But then life happens. And there are unexpected expenses. And there are issues with your job. There are all kinds of things that are going to get in the way. It's like it's all theory. And it's easy to come up with the intellectual plan. It's easy to put something on paper. It is much harder to actually execute the plan. And when you talk about finances and how things go wrong and how things get messed up and how things get flipped upside down, one of the things I've noticed is how wasteful we are as Americans. And it really starts when, when we're kids. So like having kids, I see how wasteful, and they're, they're almost like leeches. Like I love them to death, okay? I love them unconditionally. But man, they just suck your financial picture right down the tube, don't they? Like, it starts when they're itty-bitty, and they have no idea what's going on. And when they're itty-bitty, and you're changing diapers, you change like 20 diapers a day. And diapers are expensive. And here's the problem with the diaper changing. You notice that they're wet, and you're like, we should change their diaper, because we don't want little Billy to get a diaper rash. So you change little Billy's diaper. As soon as you get that second strap on, Billy has the biggest mess in his diaper that he's ever had in his life. And you're like, well, that's disgusting. I can't let him sit in this. You change another diaper. You put the new diaper on. Immediately when the new diaper gets on, the sequel happens. And they say, diapers, man, diapers are so expensive. And they say they're leak-proof. And they say they're more absorbent. But I have khaki stains that would beg to differ. That they are more absorbent or that they're leak-proof or whatever it is. And so when they, the diaper stuff is expensive. And they go through a ton when they're itty-bitty. And then as they get older, you start to buy, you buy way too many toys, you have way too much stuff that you take different places with you, you look like you're about to go on a recon mission to some foreign country anytime you go anywhere. You've got stuff strapped down, you've got this game plan strategy, you and your wife are, okay, you get the kid, I'm going to get all the stuff. You're walking around with like 75 pounds worth of stuff on each arm plus backpacks, and it's like, do we need all of this? Well, yeah, you do, osh, gosh, bagosh, because like, all the stuff has to match, and it all has to fit, and it all has to go together, and blah, blah, blah. But you got all the stuff. Then they start eating food, but they're not really eating food. They're spitting the food back at you. 
because they don't like the food. To be fair, I wouldn't like that food either. It's gross. You smell it, and you're like, honey, it's great. Eat them. Like, you know, you know they're not going to eat, but you still buy. And sometimes you buy the really expensive, organic, whatever. Maybe we're the only family that did that. I'm like, I don't think this matters, but we did. And then we're feeding the kid, and they're spitting the food back at you, and it's like, oh, my goodness. And then they get older, and then you take them to restaurants, and it's like, okay, we're going to order them food. They're not going to eat the food, so why am I ordering food? Because I'll just eat what they don't eat. So the waiter's like, okay, so and what, what for you, sir? Well, um, in a few minutes, I'm going to eat some corn dogs and chicken nuggets with fries. So I'm good at the moment. I might order something after the fact. And they leave lights on, and they will get stuff out of the fridge. They'll maybe get a can of soda. They drink like one, one millionth of it, and then they don't want it anymore. My kids, we have like little things of like guacamole and hummus because we're really into health at our house. And so like they, they'll peel back that guacamole thing. And my wife's not in here, is she? Okay, we're good. We're good. Everybody, we're okay. We're just, shh, don't tell her, okay? But, like, the, you know, my kids will peel back the guacamole, and they'll eat a few bites, and they're like, uh, Dad, you want some guacamole? And I'm like, oh, my goodness, because I know I can't stand if we throw stuff away. Last night, I came in from working, and Shannon had made chili. Really good plan at the start of the day, because it was cold, and then towards the end, it warmed up. But when I came in, I saw two half-eaten bowls of chili. What did I do? I devoured those things, because I'm not throwing away good chili. Just, it's just ongoing. It's constant. But then I started thinking about my life and different things that I've done to waste my money. Do you guys remember, it's like a CD subscription. You got to be in a certain generation bracket to really know what I'm talking about. It was like Columbia, I think, was one of them. And you would, okay, so some people know. So you would, like, five cents, you would get ten CDs. You remember that? Now, it costs, what, what did I call? CDs? Yeah, compact discs, yeah, that's what you would get. CD albums, whatever. Yeah, yeah, you get cassettes, A, B. Look, the illustration's going to work regardless of what term we use, okay? So let's all stay focused here. So you'd pay five cents, and you would get, but you'd pay $50 in shipping, but you'd get these 10 CDs, and then they would send you something in the mail every month and you had to check, they would say, hey, we're going to send you these 10 CDs unless you tell us not to. And you would just forget or get lazy or whatever. So then you would get these next 10 CDs. Half of them you probably wouldn't listen to. I had two albums sent to me one time. They were in Spanish. I'm like, what am I going to do with this? Like, I, what in the world? So I called the company. They're like, no, but no English. And they hung up on me. It was a terrible experience. So I canceled that, but I was just thinking, man, that, that was something that was like just a constant waste of my money, because half the CDs I didn't even listen to. And there are all kinds of subscriptions. That, that was when I was in high school, but then like people will have food subscriptions. You have clothing subscriptions. Every month they send you something to wear, and you send them your sizes, and they're like, hey, here's an outfit for you. I think guys mostly do that, because we don't know what goes well together. It's like, this would be great. This would be really useful for me. But you get stuff, you don't like it, but then you don't take the time to send it back. There are all these streaming services that we have. Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus and ESPN Plus and probably 50 that I'm forgetting about that get debited or charged to your credit account without you doing anything. And you've got them, and you don't really watch them that much, but you've got them nonetheless, and it's just a constant waste, and it's just money that just goes out. And whenever you think about your finances, we talked about budget last week. Hopefully, you went through and started the process of figuring out, all right, this is the money that we have spending. This is going to gas. This is going to entertainment. This is what we spend when we go out to eat and different things like that. But really, hopefully, you're doing that because you, if you aren't doing that, you are wasting money on something, I can promise you. And maybe, you know, three to... $500 or $1,000 a year is not a big deal to you. If it's not, come see me after service today. I've got different places that you can put that money for us to put it to good use instead of some random streaming service that you don't really watch or listen to or whatever. But we have all these areas that we're just wasteful in. 
Now, some people are wasteful. Some people use So you're like, well, I watch my Netflix, and that's, that's something we really like, and I'm going to pay the $9, $10 a month. That's fine. As long as you're using it, it's fine. But if it's something that you don't use, that you have purchased or you're making payments on, then you are wasting your money in that area. Now, last week we also talked about and established that our money is given to us by God. It is a direct blessing from Him, and we need to manage our money in a way that is faithful to Him, responsible, and ultimately reflects His character and His goodness. It's His money that He's loaning to us, and there's a biblical term for that, and it is a steward. Steward is not a word that we use too much, but it's a person who's been given something that they don't own, but they've been given complete control over it. So different castles in England have stewards. It's not their castle, but they're in charge of it. They're in charge of the upkeep. They're in charge of keeping it clean, things like that. Well, we are stewards of our finances. God has given it to us, and he expects us to use it in a certain way. And so with our money, with our finances, we can be either wasteful or we can be faithful. And if we're honest, we waste a lot of money or we waste a little bit of money a lot of different ways and it ends up becoming a lot of money that we waste. So if you don't have a budget, and, and here's the thing about it, it's always kind of comical to me when I do premarital counseling. Because there's like a budget Nazi and a budget hippie in every marriage. One's like, let's just spend money, bro. Who doesn't matter? As long as there's money in the account, we're good. And then there's the budget Nazi who is like, where's the receipt for that purchase? What budget did it come out of? Did we have a conversation about that? It was over 25 weeks. You know, it's like, Grr. and you guys, I noticed when I said the word budget, like half of you couples went and looked at each other. And one of you's thinking, I don't want to hear about the budget anymore. You stop talking about that budget. And one of you's like, see, he's talking about the budget again. We're supposed to get a budget. We got to get the budget. Let's get a budget. Well, if you don't have a budget, you're probably more on the wasteful side of things. But even with a budget, you can be wasteful. So we want to be really strategic and intentional about spending our money the best way that we can. So Jesus tells a parable in Luke chapter 16. And the parable's about money, and the parable's about waste, and we're not going to cover the parable in its entirety, because I don't have time for that. I want to cover the first part of the parable, and I want to cover the very end. Now, the, the punchline, the basic principle is, use your money in wise ways. Do not be wasteful and worldly with your money and with how you spend it. That's the basic gist of the parable. But at the beginning of it, Jesus, as he's launching into this parable, he says, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. He was a steward. He was the manager of the finances or the budget. The rich man didn't really pay attention until one day he started to see things or hear about things that were not on the up and up. So the rich man called the steward or called the manager and asked him, what is this that I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. You are fired. I'm taking away the responsibility of managing my finances away from you <laughs> because you are wasteful and you are wasting my possessions. Now, in their time period, that was a huge deal. That was a major offense. And if the owner could prove this is how this guy's wasted my finances or wasted my possession. That guy could go to jail until that amount or that debt was paid off. So it was a very serious offense, a very serious occurrence. But you understand that in the parable, in a way, we're kind of like the ones who have been given money to manage. And it's like there's like a, a you know, a sub point here, which is, don't be wasteful with the money that God's given to you. And also, don't be really worldly with the way that you spend it. Because at the end of the parable, Jesus says a line that he says in different places in the gospel. It's recorded in different places, I should say. In verse 13, he says, hey guys, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or 
he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. He says, you cannot serve both God and money. Now, that's true of a lot. Of, you can't serve both God and anything that takes you away, potentially, from God. Because at some point, push will come to shove, and your allegiance to one will conflict with your allegiance to the other. And so in this situation, he's like, you can't serve both God and money. <coughs> money can serve you. Money can be a tool to you. Money can be something you use, but money cannot use you. You serve God. You give him all your allegiance. And if you allow anything else to creep in, then you have got a false God. You've got an idolatrous situation in your life. Now, at the beginning of our parable, we saw that Jesus is saying this to his disciples, but there were eavesdroppers in this that listen to this parable. Some of those were the Pharisees. The Pharisees, as they were listening, it says in verse 14, the Pharisees who loved money heard all of this and they were sneering at Jesus. Now he can see their sneers and he knows what they're thinking and he knows how obsessed they are with money and Luke puts in <laughs> the Pharisees love money. It's not just Jesus who knew that. Probably everybody who saw the Pharisees and interacted with them knew that they were really materialistic and they were obsessed about stuff and possessions and money. Well, Jesus said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. And what people value highly is detestable in God's sight. The things that we obsess over, the things that are really important to us, and the things that will take us away from God, God detests because the things that lead us away from him ultimately will lead us to destruction. Money is not good or bad. Money is just something. And there could be a lot of things in your life that's not good or bad. It's just something. But if you allow that something to compete with your allegiance to God and you compromise your Christian faith, you compromise what you know is right, what you know is true, what you know is best, for the sake of this area, that becomes something that is highly valued and is detestable in God's sight. I think it's interesting that as Jesus is giving this teaching, he says no one can serve two masters, you can't serve both God and money. The majority of people that lived in the Roman Empire during the time of Jesus were in poverty. It's like 67%. Two out of every three of the families that were in the Roman Empire during the time of Jesus. As this letter that Luke writes to Theophilus is written down and circulated, they're reading this and going, no one can serve both God and money. And they're, little, they're going, who has money? Who here's got money? Nobody's got money. We're all poor. Like, give us today our daily bread. Men, we don't have anything to eat this day, Lord. Please give us today's food. We don't have that problem. So if he says to them, they don't have food to eat that day, you can't serve both God and money, how do you think he would say that to us? Because we got more than just daily bread stored up in our fridges and in our cupboards. We throw away a lot of daily bread or we throw it out to the dogs or whatever. We have a, uh, a garbage disposal on our sinks because we throw away so much food as we rinse our plates. Isn't that crazy to think of? Imagine if like, you could pluck one of these people from their time period and their experiences and let them live the average American week. Like, it would be hard for them not to worship at the Golden Arches because there's just so much food everywhere. They would have a hard time even comprehending how free we are and how much we have. So if Jesus says to these guys, you can't serve both God and money, what would he say to us today? And how would he say it to us today? I got one more passage I want to cover really quick before we get to application. It's 1 Timothy chapter 6. The section, I think, is it's called the love of money in, the, in, in uh, that portion of the biblical text. And the apostle Paul says to Timothy, who's his protege, who's doing ministry in Ephesus, he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. 
But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. If we have the bare minimum, if we have our most basic needs met, we can be content with that, and we don't always need to want more. Because if you want more, too much, bad things can come your way. He says in verse 9, People who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. In their day and age, there was different ways of destruction that would come if you wanted to get rich. And the problem with their time period was, if you desired to get rich and you were not already wealthy, you were way behind the curve. You're going to have to lie, cheat, and steal in order to get rich. And if you were doing that in that time period and you got caught, you were going to have to pay the consequences in a major way. But in our time period, I'm not going to say, well, it's easy to get rich, but just recognize by this standard, we are all already there. And if we obsess, not just on the acquisition of money, but we obsess over the spending aspect and over the stuff and over the possessions, it will bring us to ruin and destruction as well. Things like, but not limited to, bankruptcy and foreclosure and a car getting repossessed and creditors calling you and tons of stress and fighting among husband and wife and tension and friction and sleepless nights. You're not making the minimum payments, or you are making the minimum payments, but then you look at the actual interest that you're going to be paying on whatever it is, and you're like, man, that's a lot of money. Did I really need, fill in the blank, did I really need that thing? 90 days, same as cash, but I'm on like day 300 of this, and I'm paying an astronomical interest amount. Like, you want, and you grab, and you go, and eh, and it will plunge you into ruin and destruction. And here's why. Because the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Now notice it's not money. Money's not that money's just money. Stuff is just stuff. So you can have a boat, an ATV side by side, you can have brand new vehicles, you can have a you know really beautiful big decked out house. You can have all that stuff. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the love of that. We're talking about that you can't serve two masters. So when this stuff starts to get a grip of your heart and take you away from God, that's when you've crossed the line. So it's not money or stuff, possessions, cars. That stuff's not the root of all kinds of evil. It's the love of that stuff that is the root of all kinds of evil and problems in your life and in your marriage. Some people eager for money, they've wandered away from the faith. They have walked away from God in some way. Their relationship with God has taken a hit. So they've wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now remember, in the previous scripture that we covered, and Jesus is talking about the Pharisees, and he says, you justify your, your behavior. You justify yourself among the people around you. It's like you have made an excuse as to why you buy the things you buy, or why you are the way you are. And we do the same thing. And the problem is, the metric that we use to figure out if we're okay or not, is we compare ourselves to other people. The problem with this is, everybody else is jacked up too. And so you think, well, we're not that far off, we're not that bad, because, you know, so-and-so, they've got real problems. They're spending their money really irresponsibly, but not us. Well, compared to them, you're not, but are you, are you being wasteful with how you spend your money? What are you willing to go into debt to obtain? Debt's something that's changed over the course of the last hundred years, and how we go into debt, and what we're willing to go into debt for. Think about a hundred years ago, so 1921. What were people willing to go into debt for? Like nothing. Maybe their house, but nothing else. And then, what were their kids willing to go into debt for? Well, maybe the house, 
and most likely the house, but nothing else. Well, what were their kids willing to go into debt for? Well, the house, but just one car. And then their kids, it was the house and two cars. And their kids, it's the house and two cars, and we'll have some credit card debt. And then their kids, and I don't know how many generations I've gone here, but you're just going with me, right? Then it's the house and two cars and credit card debt and student loans. And we've got tons of money that goes out to, stu- that, you know, goes out to student loans. And it's like, no, I need to go to college. I'm not saying college is bad, but we've got a real problem on our hands with debt and spending. One of the problems is, uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to soapbox, I'll get off in just a second, but just go with me. Because student loans are now guaranteed by the government, the price of college has gone like through the roof. It's not really fair. So now you got these 18, 19 year old kids taking out loans. College is good, okay? I'm not saying college is bad, but the way that things are being done is bad because now these kids have way too much money in student loans, getting degrees that aren't going to get them the job to pay for this. It's like, oh my goodness, madness. And if we make college for free, what do you think that's going to do to the cost of college? It's like there needs to be some accountability somewhere from, for somebody. Doug Junkins, presidential candidate, 2024, okay? I'm going, <laughs> all right. I'll have t-shirts and signs made up next week. You can pick them up in the foyer on your way out, right? But when we think about debt, we're so casual and comfortable with it. But like 100 years ago, it wasn't that way. Now, the Great Depression, which happened in the 1930s, made people of that generation really uncomfortable with debt. I get it. But there's a biblical principle that's here as well. Proverbs 22, verse 7 says this. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant, or some translations will say slave, to the lender. When the Bible talks about debt, it never paints it in a positive light. It never says, well, you know, it's okay to go in the day. That's a, man, that's a, that's a really nice Rolex or whatever it is that people are wanting to buy. Yeah, you deserve that. Yeah, you work hard. Yeah, you should go finance that. The Bible never paints that picture. Now, the exception that I would make in our day and age is your house. Because your house is the one thing that does not depreciate the moment you buy it. If I go buy a brand new car tomorrow, the moment those wheels come off the lot, it depreciates like 20%. Now, you know that like 37 percent of statistics are made up on the spot so I don't actually know what percentage it depreciates but I'm sure it's a lot okay but I think it's right around 20 percent and if I didn't put enough down on the car I'm upside down on it the moment I take it home it's got like two miles on it so I'm in trouble so we need to be less comfortable with debt but when you look at our nation's financial picture and I'm not talking the government which is a different sermon for another day Whenever I get in the presidential debates leading up to 2024, I'll I'll, I'll address those things, okay? But just in terms of like personal finances and how we manage or mismanage our money, I'm going to show you four areas of debt that the average American family has. And I hope that it causes you some anxiety and heart palpitations, okay? If it doesn't, you're probably too comfortable with debt. First, let's talk about car payments. If you have a new car, if you have a used car, if you have leased a car, these are your average payments. $563 a month for a brand new car is the average car payment in the American household if you buy a new car. You drive a leased vehicle, which is the most expensive way to drive a vehicle, it's $450 a month, it's right at $400 a month for a used car. Americans owe $1.4 trillion, that's with a T, Wrap your mind around that, $1.4 trillion in principle on auto loans. That is a lot of money. Now, once again, we justify ourselves. And so you might say, well, yeah, I mean, I've got a car payment, and I bought a used car, but it's only two seventy-five. dollars Well, that's better than three ninety-seven, dollars but it's not as good as zero. Now, once again, I, I was up front with you last week. I just paid off my wife's van. I just looked. It's, it was six months ago. So I'm not saying, oh, I never have a car payment, you peasants with your car. I, okay? So I'm in there with you. But when you pay off a vehicle, drive that stinking thing into the ground. 
until it doesn't look good anymore, until whenever you see it, you hate it. You're like, I don't want to drive this anymore. Then you start making payments to yourself. So then, man, you'll feel so much better if whenever you have enough to buy a different vehicle, you just go strutting in there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. I'm going to pay in ones. I'm going to bring in a briefcase. Of George Washington's for everybody. Okay, you guys got to count that now. You know, like I'll make a mess in the, in the finance room. But like this is out of hand. $1.4 trillion. Then there's credit card debt. Now, you can, I think, at least somewhat justify an auto loan. But when you get the credit card debt, there's no really good reason. Unless you had to buy something, some medical expense. I'm not, I mean, there's so, there are caveats to this. But if you're just going to Burger King too many times, and you're just frivolously spending at Walmart making minimum payments, like, you're in trouble there, okay? So the average credit card debt is $7,000. You know, the average American family has $7,000 in credit card debt, and Americans owe roughly half a trillion dollars in that as well. Let's go to house payments now. Now, remember, house payments, that's equity. You put 20% down, and you're making payments on that. When you sell it, you should get money out of the home, right? But still, the borrower is slave to the lender. And the average American family owes $195,000 on their home. $10 trillion in real estate debt in our country. $10 trillion, which is pretty insane. And then you finally get the student loans. $57,000 for the average American family in student loans to the tune of $1.56 trillion in student loan debt. So we are somewhere in the ballpark. Remember, you never do math in public, but here we go. Somewhere in the ballpark of $13.5 trillion in debt just in those four areas. Now, you throw it like, I didn't look up medical expenses, things like that, because if you have to have a life-saving surgery and you go into debt, like, I'm not going to come down on you for doing that. That's not frivolous spending. That's somebody saving a life. So, but, I mean, there's a lot in medical debts as well, just all across the board just a lot of debt and a lot of it if we're honest a lot of it could be avoided or at the very least brought down a little bit like you know we could talk about a car I don't think you're being sinful if you have a car payment that's not for me to say that's between you and the Lord okay but where we get ourselves into trouble is when we put no money down and we finance like you can finance a used car for 72 months no money down, 72 months, you're going to be upside, upside down on that car at some point in driving it. That's just a bad place to be. That's an irresponsible place to be. And if you want to buy a new car, I have no problem if you want to buy a new car. I don't manage your money. God gave your, you that money for you to manage. But like, you got to be careful because now you can finance an auto loan for a brand new car for like 80-something months. And I think they're getting into the 90s. Which, side note, that frustrates me, by the way. Because I'm a guy who, I don't buy the new car, I buy like the second or third hand car, but because people are now financing for so long, we think, okay, can I afford the car? And then they just look at the monthly payments, they don't think what they're spending over the life of the car. So it drives the, the actual cost of the vehicle up, and it still depreciates, but the depreciation number is higher than it would have been, which hurts schmucks like me, who are trying to buy cheaper gently used vehicles and so what you have is the more we're willing to take on debt and the more freely we're willing to take out loans the more that things are going to cost across the board and so like when you think about debt don't be casual or comfortable with debt yeah every American family you know it's like okay so every American family has you know all these loans but we're not as bad off as they are but if you have a loan, you are still slave to the lender. And you should get rid of that debt as quick as you can. Now, one practical way to do that, and I don't know if Dave Ramsey came up with this, but he's the guy who made it famous. It's called the debt snowball. And what you do with the debt snowball is you line your debts up with the smallest principal balance to the largest. Okay? You take your minimum payment. 
And let's just say you got a Kohl's credit card, ladies. I've not met one guy who's had a Kohl's credit card. So, ladies, this is for you. Now, fellas, I got the Lowe's credit card you know, on there as well just to cover you. So everybody has been offended equally, I hope. Okay, But you've got your Kohl's credit card. You've got $450 that you owe on there. But my goodness, you got more Kohl's cash than anybody in your neighborhood, which is great, good for you. The minimum payment on that is $50 a month. So here's what you've done. You've done your budget, and you said, we're going to get out of debt. And so we're supposed to be paying $50 a month, and we scrounged up an additional $50 a month that we're going to pay towards that debt. So in about five months, your Kohl's credit card bill goes away. And cut that thing up immediately. If you pay your principal off every month, I don't care if you have a credit card. But if you go into debt for it, like you may have a problem that you just need to cold turkey it. So now you've got $100 a month that was going to Kohl's. It's paid off. So you take that 100 and you add it to your Lowe's payment. So you've got the 100 that you paid before plus the 30 of minimum payment. So now you're paying $130 a month for Lowe's. In no time, that's going to be paid off. You've got that 130 you got your Visa credit card. You're both guilty. You've both been spending on that. But you take that $40 minimum payment plus the 130 now you've got 170 That thing's going to get paid off like five times as fast. Then you move to the car. Minimum payment's $400 a month. You're making your minimum payments, but now you add the 170 to it. So you're going to be paying $570 a month. And then down to the student loan. So you got $10,000. You went to Rin Lake for two years because... There's no other way to go to college unless you're wicked smart or really athletic. But you've only got $10,000. You were really careful. You spent well and you were really disciplined. But you still want to get rid of that student debt. Because that, that's, it just follows you around. You're still slave to that. So the minimum payment is $200. And you take your $570 from your previous paid off balances. Add your $200. And you're paying $770 a month towards getting rid of that debt. Now you may say, well... What if I, I mean, the, the student loan is at a low interest rate. But what if I took that, you know, $570 and I put it back for a car or I put it back for whatever? Hey, you're the one who's in charge of your finances, not me. And I am in no way, shape, or form a financial expert. So don't come asking me what you should do with your money. My response will be give more to the church, probably. But other than that, I don't have an opinion on what you do with your finances. You're the steward of your finances. God wants you to manage your finances faithfully and prayerfully and not wastefully. And it's, gonna, it's a moving scale in terms of what's waste and what's needed. To use a really minor example, some people play golf and they play Pro V1 golf balls. I've never bought Pro V1 golf balls. Do you know why? Because I would hit them just as bad as I do the rocks that I currently play. In fact, you could put a round rock on the tee for me, and I would hit it in the woods just like I would a $5 you know, piece golf ball. I play top flights or whatever I find in the woods when I'm looking for my ball. Okay. So for you, you may say, well, no, I, I like to play Pro V1s. Well, that's good for you. It would be wasteful for me to buy Pro V1s. It would be vanity. It would be for the sake of looking like a real golfer even though I'm not really a real golfer. You can just go on down the list. In my stage of life, like I think you said, we, we got rid of TV. We don't have cable in our house. We're not home enough to watch anything. And you're like, well, we have it. Good for you. I, your management of your finance, just because I've done something doesn't mean that you should or shouldn't. And so it's really between you and the Lord. But do not, and this is, this is my challenge to you, do not leave here today without at least having the conversation of what we need to do different as a family or what you need to do different as an individual. Figure things out. Create a budget. Get rid of your debt. Like, do your best to be faithful with what God has blessed you with. And you're the one who knows what's true and what's not. You know, also with the Pharisees, Jesus says, you know, you guys can play the games all you want, but God knows your heart. And God knows our hearts as well. And he knows how faithful we're willing to be to him. And if we're working hard at managing our money his way, and if we're trying to be faithful as opposed to wasteful, God knows our heart.
and God does bless. When we put him first in our finances, when we sacrificially give, and when we're strategic and intentional about where every dollar goes, God blesses in big ways. Then it's up to you whether or not you come and get that blessing.